The events on May 4, 1970 are remembered as a catalyst during the Vietnam War era. The reckless actions of both students and military influenced others across the country to revolt, causing a vast uprise in strikes and debates. These actions served as America's wake-up call in an era of diplomatic uncertainty. This is the story of the Kent State shootings. It begins with Operation Menu, a bombing campaign introduced by President Nixon that targeted eastern Cambodia, close to Vietnam's border. This campaign was concealed from the United States, so much so that pilots weren't even told where they were bombing. These acts of secrecy from the U.S. government were eventually leaked by William M. Beecher on the New York Times, and the news spread like wildfire amongst critics who disapproved of Nixon's plan going through without Congress approval. Many were upset at President Nixon for bombing a neutral country that was not directly involved, since Vietnamese troops were only traveling through to transport supplies. The slow decline in college military deferment also contributed to the discontent from students, as deferment eligible school programs grew less thanks to the 1967 Draft Act. A companion peace demonstration brings out 50,000 marchers in downtown San Francisco. They parade two miles along Market Street, pacifists and hippies together. Seeing these events, the country began questioning the extent of Nixon's executive power. This is where Kent State University comes into play. After the announcement of America's Vietnam attacks on April 30th, 1970, protests on Kent State University campus began the following day on May 1st. Throughout the day, rallies and intense speeches struck the commons, a grassy area located in the middle of the campus. Students even buried a copy of the Constitution to signify President Nixon's attacks without Congress's declaration of war. To control these protests, members of the Ohio National Guard began arriving on May 2nd, and as they reached the site, they found the Reserve Officer Training Corps building near the Commons set aflame by protest demonstrators. One day later, on May 3rd, nearly 1,000 Ohio National Guardsmen flooded the campus, along with Ohio's governor, James Rhodes. Rhodes declared that protests and movements on campus were banned from that point, and that retaliation against the Ohio Guardsmen would be considered a felony. He also stated that any students who continued to riot on campus would be dismissed and banned from other state universities. These events further sparked aggressive tension between Kent State students and the Ohio National Guard that led up to the casualties on May 4th. May 4th, 1970, the day of the shootings. Though university staff had warned the protesters beforehand that rallying was forbidden, on May 4th, 1970, many students had already started to gather on the commons near Taylor Hall at 11 a.m. And by noon, an estimated 3,000 people had assembled. The protests were initially peaceful, with some speeches made and a few participants carrying flags. The protests started to pick up steam after a second order to disperse was made, since the first order was not loud enough for the students to notice. This area immediately. Three Ohio National Guardsmen and a policeman from Kent State rode past the students twice in a jeep, announcing their order from a bullhorn. In response, the students began to chant power to the people. After the third round of driving past the crowd and ordering them to disperse, the crowd began to chant, one, two, three, four, we don't want your war, and the word strike repeatedly. This pattern continued for a while, and new chants arose, including the phrase Sieg Heil, which was a victory salute used in Nazi Germany, meaning Hail Victory. During this routine, rocks began to be thrown at the jeep, which never did substantial damage. To mitigate the chaos, tear gas was fired into the crowd, but had minor effect. Some students picked up the tear gas canisters and threw them back at the guard, which received cheers from the crowd. Shortly after, from 12.05 p.m. to 12.15 p.m., troops were ordered to load their guns with one round in each chamber. Company C was instructed that if they were to fire their guns, it would be in the air, but no such orders were given to Company A or Troop G. The guards would keep pursuing the students and hurting them while getting hit by rocks as they moved to the practice field on campus. There, they were instructed to kneel and aim their rifles at the students without firing. This continued until the guard was told to retreat back up the hill that Taylor Hall sat on, named Blanket Hill. And as the guards were relocating, students began to follow them up the hill hurling rocks, thinking they had exhausted their tear gas supply, when suddenly, after reaching the highest part of Blanket Hill, they turned around and fired their guns.
Four students, two of which were not part of the rally, were killed. The victims were Allison Krauss, Jeffrey Miller, William Schroeder, and Sandra Schuer. Nine other students were wounded. The Kent State Debate There are several stories that tell us to why the guard fired, and most of the guardsmen say their reason for firing was that they felt their lives were in danger. Some guards felt that students were surrounding them or that students were charging at them aggressively when they followed the guards up the hill. But in photo evidence, the nearest student was almost 50 feet away. Another stance the guards took was that they fired in response to hearing a sniper, which was later disproven. General Robert Canterbury reported that there was no order from any officer telling the guards to fire in a press conference one day after the shootings. Not all guardsmen had fired. But there were also many who believed the Ohio National Guard was not in a life-threatening situation. An interview with President Nixon shows his response to the shootings, sympathizing with the students and advising others to deal with the same types of situations in a safer way. We were going to find methods that would be more effective to deal with these problems of violence, methods that would deal with those who would use force and violence and endanger others, but at the same time would not take the lives of innocent people. The victims of the shootings were paid $675,000 from the state of Ohio, but the question of which side was at fault still remained. A Gallup poll held by the American Institute of Public Opinion showed that 58% of those surveyed blamed the shootings on the students, 11% blamed the National Guard, and 31% were impartial. Nonetheless, the country was shaken after seeing the outcome of the chaos. Parents of Jeffrey Miller felt strongly that the violence was from the government, and that a few stones were not enough to kill anybody. The parents and neighbor of Allison Krauss had also critiqued President Nixon and the military's judgment regarding the shootings, saying that students didn't deserve to be shot for opposing the actions of their government. Poems, songs, and other tributes were made to remember May 4, 1970, and memorials continue to this day. The Impact of the Kent State Shootings the ignorance of the protesting students is what caused the guards to fire, as was the ignorance of the guards themselves. Even today, there isn't a clear answer as to who was guilty for the actions on May 4, 1970, whether it was the Kent State students or the Ohio National Guard. But that day will forever serve as a warning to violent peacemakers and hot-headed rebels in the future.